winter under my roof into my heart make it your home fractured stained and scarred yet longing for you touch me lord with your healing make me Hi, my name is Kathleen Basie. I am an author and a composer for the WLP Division of GIA Publications, and I'm here today to tell you a story. It's a story that begins two hours after the birth of my daughter, before I'd even gotten a chance to hold her, when the doctor came into the recovery room and told me that she has Down syndrome. I did not know it then, but in that moment, God had taken me by the shoulders and gently turned me from walking one path, a path of practicing my Catholic faith, and moved me to a new path, one in which I would learn to be intentional about viewing the whole world in all its messy, nitty-gritty wonder through the lens of that faith. I'd like to spend the next few minutes sharing with you how that transformation came about in the hopes that it can illuminate something for your own spiritual journey. When the doctor came into the room and uttered those words, chromosomal abnormality, my first thought was, I don't want this baby, I'm gonna give it up for adoption. Now, you need to understand that I was raised in the pro-life movement. I went on the marches, I put brochures under windshields the Sunday before all of the elections, got into arguments in my speech class in high school, the whole works. I considered myself to be 100% pro-life. When I was pregnant, people would come up to me and ask, do you want it to be a boy or a girl? And I would always say, oh, I don't care as long as it's healthy. And even at that time, that little niggling voice in the back of my head wasn't comfortable with that qualifier. But I didn't pay any attention because it wasn't gonna matter, I was never gonna have a child with a medical condition anyway, until I did. And my first reaction was anything but pro-life. It was a pretty bruising collision with the mirror. What turned all of that around for me was when I received an email from a religious person who prayed in public by email for God to remove the demonic influence from my daughter, that God would remove the, uh, her Down syndrome and make her the person that she was always meant to be. Two things clarified for me in that moment. Number one, she is exactly who God meant her to be. Down syndrome is knit into every cell in her body. And if, her, if that Down syndrome was removed, she would not be God, Juliana the way God meant her to be. She would be somebody entirely different. She was made the way she was for a reason. And second, I realized how easy it is to distort faith in God because that prayer showed a deep bias against disability, an assumption that disability was a scourge, a whole set of biases that the person praying that prayer didn't even recognize were 100% in conflict with the gospel. It showed a corruption of the faith based on a worldly value rather than a godly one. That was all it took. After that, my husband and I were all in. And in the next few years, we got involved very deeply in the disability community. And through that work, I had a host of other revelations that hit me across the face, things that I had never even thought of. For instance, disability is expensive. And I don't just mean money, I'm talking about time. Your average typically developing child is plugged into some cosmic Wi-Fi network from which they download all of their developmental milestones like magic. A child with a disability has to be taught all of those milestones through therapy, and let me tell you, they are dearly bought. My daughter started therapy, physical occupational speech therapy, at three weeks old, and up until she was three years old, she had five therapy appointments a week. That is a lot of money, but it's also a lot of time. Imagine planning that around naps for a baby. If we had not had fabulous therapists who were aware of the needs of our entire family, my older child would not have had a childhood at all. As it was, his childhood was structured around his sister's therapies. 
We learned in those three years of other families where the couple's marriage had just disintegrated under the stress of raising a child with a disability because their needs were so, were so profoundly intense that they could not get a babysitter. They literally never got a day off. They never got an evening off to go out together as a couple and they could never tend to their marriage. They never got that break. Then there were the medical things. When my daughter was six weeks old, she contracted RSV and almost died. We came home, but we came home with a $50,000 hospital bill. When she was six months old, she had to have heart surgery. You can add 100,000 for that one. At two, she was back in the ICU for pneumonia. Now, my daughter is 13 years old now, and she is absolutely flourishing. In fact, she's disgustingly healthy. <laughs> Uh, because she was given what she needed to flourish without counting the cost. That is what it takes for a person with a disability to have the chance to reach their potential and to become a contributing member of society. Disability is a burden. It is a joyful burden, but it is a burden. And whitewashing that does no one any good. Now, my family is very, very lucky. We have great insurance through my husband's work at a publicly funded university. We have a state funded program that covers therapies for children with disabilities up to age three. And we live in a county that provides an unimaginable array of services to people of all ages with disabilities through public funding. All of those things that we, that all the costs associated with my child's upbringing, we paid almost none of those. It was all covered by the community. It did not take long being involved in the disability community to realize that not everybody had what we have. We heard from people who, who refused promotions because when they were living in poverty, their child was covered by Medicaid and their child with a disability could get all of the, all of the services that they needed. But if they took that promotion, it was going to take, it was going to make them not eligible for Medicaid anymore, and they weren't getting enough more money to cover what they were losing. So it was better for them to remain in poverty. I realized that there's a population out there that's every bit as vulnerable and maybe more invisible than the unborn because they have fewer people to speak for them. I got involved in an effort to require insurers to cover therapies for kids because a lot of the private insurance companies didn't. And a self-proclaimed pro-life legislator who did have a child with a disability himself told me that health insurance is meant to cover extraordinary circumstances, not ordinary circumstances. And since therapies for children with disabilities are ordinary for them, that it was inappropriate for the government to step in and say that, and, and make sure that children were covered equally across the board. I was angry, like Jesus and the money changers angry. But in retrospect, I'm really grateful to that, to that man because he clarified something for me that I wouldn't have realized otherwise. I realized that if we say these kids have a right to be born and we are willing to enshrine that right into the law, but we are not willing to lift one finger as a society to help families bear the burden once they are here, then we have missed the point of being pro-life. And I realized that if the question of being a pro-life Christian touches this many sticky real-world issues just surrounding disability, what does that mean for all the other issues that we bicker about? Enter under my roof, into my mind, make it your own. Jaded, quick to judge, yet longing to learn. For my thoughts in compassion make me new, enter in. All these things were so obvious. They were right in line with Catholic teaching, with the things the church had been saying for generations, but I had never seen it because I wasn't being intentional about examining the world in the light of my faith. I was just practicing. And the more I discovered, the more I realized was left to discover. Let's return to that question of health insurance and therapy because it brings up another thorny issue for Christians, the issue of bias. 
That self-proclaimed pro-life legislator was a white guy with a white-collar job and an education that gave him the tools he needed to advocate for his child and a community around him that would support him in that effort. He was just like me, in other words. But that is a privilege that not everyone shares. So maybe, yes, in theory, anyone, regardless of background, could advocate for their child the way that man and the way I advocate for our children. But if a parent hasn't had the access to the good education to help them navigate these things, if they don't live in a secure situation so that half of their mental and emotional energy at any given time is devoted to simply surviving and trying to figure out how to navigate a world that is stacked against them, they do not have the emotional and mental bandwidth left to advocate for their children. They don't have what I have. Maybe they can do the things that I do, but they will have to work a lot harder and they won't get as far as I will. So what does that mean for my responsibility as a Christian? I was formed on a belief that God helps those who help themselves, and by extension, if you don't help yourself, there's no one and nothing to blame except yourself. Because if you really wanted to, you'd just reach down and pull on those bootstraps and take care of it. Your problems are nobody else's responsibility. It's not society's problem. I was learning that the reality was a lot more nuanced than that. Because some of these problems are societal problems. How many of the things that I hold as fundamental truths about the way the world is supposed to work really only hold true for people who have the advantages that I have? Then it occurred to me how many of the things I take for granted, which maybe aren't necessarily true for everyone, might actually have a huge impact on the abortion issue directly. Inequality of education, institutional racism, generational poverty, lack of access to health care and child care and a support network. All of these things put tremendous strain on women in crisis pregnancies. It makes it hard for them to choose life. I had all those advantages and it was hard for me. Look how, my, how I reacted when I was confronted with this. And I realized if we are not willing to undertake the effort to address societal problems at the level of society, then how can we possibly call ourselves pro-life? How can we possibly say that we are living the gospel? Enter under my roof into my words, make them your own. Hasty, thoughtless glib, yet longing for grace. Touch my tongue with your mercy, make me new, enter in. The more intentional I am about seeing all of life through the lens of my Catholic faith, the farther the ripple effects spread. Being pro-life has implications in the coronavirus era. It means I have a responsibility to follow medical guidelines about social distancing and masking, even if it's a real sacrifice. Because how is it pro-life to say, oh, this is all an overreaction, the death rate's only two or three percent. Being pro-life has implications for environmental issues. It means accepting that the poorest people are the ones who actually feel the effects and, and are the ones who suffer from climate change, like Puerto Rico after a hurricane, for instance. And therefore, my responsibility to uphold the life and dignity of those Jesus called the least of these presupposes a commitment to protect the earth as well. Even if it's inconvenient, like washing and reusing things instead of throwing them in the trash when I'm done. Even if it means accepting some minor discomfort, like turning off the car and rolling the windows down when I'm in a pickup line instead of running the air conditioner for half an hour. Even if it means I have to pay more for certain products because environmental regulations make them more expensive to produce. Being intentional about the faith means digging down below the surface of every question to see all the ripple effects and then discern all of those ripple effects through the lens of the gospel. It means examining my conscience. Where am I holding attitudes in my life that reflect worldly rather than godly values and priorities? And once I recognize all these things, then comes the real question. 
the one I'm going to send you out today to ponder. Once I recognize it, what do I do about it? Enter under my roof, take Lord these hands, make them your own. Calloused, chained by pride, yet longing to serve, lead me Lord into freedom, make me new.